for the first time, so we can start. Uh, it is our pleasure to have Seri Marcos Moret from the Department of Economics, the University of Essex, to present in this session. So we will be starting right now. Thank you for coming. And, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. So good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you so much for the hospitality. And yesterday's dinner was uh, a great occasion. Um, so I've been talking about so-called multi-agent global macro net uh, models and added actually a new term there, granular global macro nets. So uh, why do I think this is an important area that we need to investigate for purposes of macroprudential policy? Um, I claim after a 50-year hiatus when econometrics and proof level was the only way of investigating uh, economic or economic modeling, uh, we do need a new set of tools uh, to actually get to what I call big data and be able to handle uh, the granularity and the details we need to get into macro models and macro credential models to find out if there is a crisis looming. Um, so of course, this, this uh, area which uh, says that we need to understand interconnectedness, as you know, came out from Al Andrew Haldane's um, um, talk he gave at the Amsterdam Student Union, University of Amsterdam Student Union, and it's been very influential. Uh, we simply don't seem to understand the conduits, the transmission mechanisms, as in a causal way, as opposed to statistical correlations between various uh, entities in the financial e and economic system. And the equation driven mainstream models are uh, mostly uh, the reduced form, and a lot of the feedback loops that are necessary to understand how a crisis starts building, especially the post and so on, are usually missing. I mean, the details, the carry trades, the offshoring, uh, imbalances, and that sort of thing, you know, how do they keep piling on? Uh, we, we seem to lack um, um, a way of showing that, in, I wouldn't say real time, but close enough. Um, so the global consequences, uh, you know, because I need to make a case that we need to have global macro net models, not just within the economy uh, or national systems uh, uh, characterization, because the crisis can occur from many uh, avenues. And in particular, I, I would emphasize, that I don't need to make a case for that in a very big way, about how the, the global macro net uh, or the global perspective is important. For instance, Alan Atoll has this paper which says, you know, the European banks had huge exposures to the US securitized asset markets. And why was this not detected? Partly because, you know, either we study, as we showed, you know, various systems in a national capacity rather than understanding the global uh, interconnections. So I'm going to actually develop for you a global perspective as well. And um, in addition to the global perspective, so there are threats from there, and there are, of course, threats to sustainable growth that are coming from within uh, the financial sector as well. Um, and I would emphasize that there is a lot to do with the huge negative externalities coming from the size of the financial sector per se relative to other sectors of the economy. And this is the sort of thing that has been emphasized by Stockhammer, Rogram Raj, and Philip Wall, and so on. And they're just uh, you know, sort of pointing out that in some sense, with very large size, the cover of Gabe, uh, Gabe uh, framework as well is something that I'm very interested in as, uh, you know, exploring uh, in, in greater depth to show that um, <coughs> the, uh, the threats from a very oversized uh, uh, financial sector as opposed to the other sectors have huge implications uh, for the volatility of GDP itself. We have other, other uh, aspects of the problem, as you know, the Phillips curve becoming flat, the fact that the inflation has disappeared from the RPI index, uh, and all of these things lead for a lot of issues to do with how we understand um, macro threats. Um, this is one of the key things uh, that is important to what has happened to banking and how banks are behaving badly. Uh, this is a slide that was produced by uh, Olive Burrows from the Bank of England at this conference last year, the S in the ESRT conference, uh, called Diversity in Macroeconomics. And basically what it shows is that in, the, in terms of uh, total lending of uh, the monetary and financial institutions uh, to the so-called core PNFC, which is the private non-financial corporations, in other words, to the real sector, 
as you can see, it is minuscule. From about 20%, it's fallen to 8%. Uh, the rest of the money is lent between uh, the interbank. You know, banks are lending other financial to other financial institutions, and then to secured loans, uh, which is mostly in the form of mortgages. So what we're saying is, in advanced OECD economies, uh, this is of course the UK case. Hardly eight percent of uh, GDP is lent for real, per, you know, real uh, uh, to not to the private sector for purposes of what we call real growth or real investment. So I don't think large economies and advanced economies can survive with this very trickle down. You know, hardly any of it. Most of it is just sort of building up bubbles in, in existing assets. And uh, you know, from for within the interbank, uh, you know, within the large demands uh, uh, posed by the financial sector itself to finance its finance itself. So these are some of the threats that are uh, looming out there, uh, and the the linking up between the financial and the macro uh, sector in terms of interconnections and so on. As you know, the the Carvalho Gavi. Uh, Gabe framework is also an input output thing, which is uh, going to, which can be portrayed as networks, and we need to link up at a very granular level the structures between the financial sectors and the real sectors. So, um, I the, the the framework that I would be uh, expounding here is a framework that was developed by Kestrana Rakan in the ECB paper in 2012, and it is called a global macro net. And what they do is they use the, the BIS data where you have a sector flow of funds within countries and then they link it up with the global uh, 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 banking flows between uh, the lender countries uh, uh, which are uh, uh, to, to, the, the, to, the, to banking systems of about 22 uh, countries. So you would find that 22 banking systems are exposed to 150 uh, countries uh, but of course, at that level, until 2010, it was not, it was only, you would only see it at a very aggregated level. But since 2010, this has extended it to, in, to include sectoral breakdowns within countries. So in other words, you would see how various of the banking systems, like the 22 banking systems, are exposed not just to your country's aggregated uh, loans, but also uh, the sectors from which the demand is coming. So you would be able to isolate, or you'd be able to identify not only which country uh, has huge liabilities to which banking systems. So if we had really sort of focused on those sorts of things, we would have seen that uh, you know, the huge exposure of the European banking, si uh, banking systems to the American uh, securitized assets. So we, you know, these are the sorts of, uh, this is the sort of yeah, granularity one is hoping to attain. So of course, uh, to sort of step back a bit and to go back to what we were discussing yesterday, why was it, you know, there's a steadfast, this is quoting Charles Goodhart, uh, in macroeconomics there's a steadfast refu refusal to face a number of facts. Uh, he has a number of, uh, you know, uh, such facts that he, he relates to, but the one I'm going to talk about is this problem we have about understanding risk, uh, risk. and we, we take uh, volatility, a standard deviation of asset returns or whatever, to sort of identify risk. And there are major issues to do with it. So here is the picture that I uh, was, uh, you know, where this was, where I was struck by this. It was in about 2012, and I was invited to present at the IMF. And before I went there, I just thought I'll take the Sogoviano Goodhart <coughs> Banking Stability Index, which is uh, the green uh, uh, graph here, and then I compared it with the VIX and the VFTSE, which are just publicly available. Uh, volatility indices. Um, hey, Presto, this is exactly the sort of point that was raised yesterday by Silvan and so on. Uh, the uh, so the Vienna Goodhart Bank and Stability Index is a highly complex, sophisticated sort of calculation uh, in, in a cross sectional <laughs> sense. They look at copulas and you know co movements of uh, 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 the bank prices. It's actually um, the CDS based, uh, so it is about risk free. Uh, the, uh, the default premium. Uh, however, so they they take all the very advanced techniques to understand extreme co-movements. However, when it's, when it's consolidated into a single statistic, it has no more information in it, as you can see, than uh, the VIX itself. 
And the VIX, as we, we uh, in my opinion, the VIX really uh, led to this euphemism of what they call great moderation. I then think when the, uh, and you can see here, when the big bubble, this is the FTSE itself, and the bubble was forming, as you know, there's an inverse relationship, the VIX is hugely subdued. So you, unless you understood the Hamilton sort of regime switching uh, statistics, that means uh, during a boom, volatility is low, and during a bust, volatility jumps up. However, this was interpreted with a combination of low inflation and low volatility. We were uh, drawn in, we were sort of seduced by this to call this great moderation, and we thought there was no risk at all. And it's very difficult to argue against this, because once people had bought into this as being the statistic for the measure of risk and so on, and volatility, as you know, it was called the fear gauge, um, the index itself, you have this huge problem that uh, you could be misled if you were sort of uh, buying into this. And as you can see, it's contemporaneous with the crisis. The VIX jumped up when the, when the market tanked. In other words, there's no early warning signal. And the same thing was actually seen and uh, explained by uh, Sylvain yesterday at great length. Uh, they are all contemporaneous with the crisis. There is no early warning signal. So this was. This is a paper from uh, the IMF now, 2013 paper, so we're with Laura Cotteris and so on, and they do one of these beauty contests about all of the very popular time-bearing COA, rolling COA, Tibor de Yilmish, uh, and uh, systemic CCA and so on. This is the contingent claim analysis, distance to distress sort of thing here. And then what they do is the black curves are the ones that identify the crisis, and they want to see if any of the uh, systemic risk indices give any sort of early warning signal. And the paper is called Coincident or Near Coincident um, uh, 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 Systemic Risk Indices. And as you can see, you know, they all jump up with the prices. I mean, you know, here you have, uh, you know, there is no early warning signal there at all. This is the time very one of the most popular ones. And here you have, this is even worse. I mean, this gives all early, the signal comes for after the crisis. And uh, this, the Devold and Yildish gives some sort of indication, right, as you can see, that's pretty good. I mean, at least here you were given some early warning. But then, you know, you may uh, dismiss all of these big, these things because you don't have a threshold to say well, how much is, how, you know, if the index jumps up, how should you get worried? You know, you need a threat, you need something to compare this. You need to have something else to compare an index with to see should we be worried. And this really, as you can see, is off, off the wall. I mean, simply too little, too late. So um, they, they, so this is, I think, damning in addition to uh, the, the sorts of things you want to say. However, there is a steadfast refusal to face these facts because this is, you know, the hundreds upon hundreds of papers are produced uh, on a daily basis based on publicly available, available market price data to concoct yet another systemic risk index and the hope of what? I, you know, I think there's a point at which you have to say this is not working. So where would you look for, uh, where would you look for the crisis? Let me, uh, I'm hoping, no, it's not yet. Uh, my great, uh, so I have a, uh, so what I would say is where would you look for the crisis? Uh, you would look to Ivan Minsky. I mean, he, you know, you know the volatility paradox is something that uh, was raised in the 1980s by him. He says, uh, the crisis, the seeds of any crisis are built exactly at the period of the boom when the market looks very healthy. Um, and therefore, you should look at the actual liabilities that are building up in the system. You have to go back to basics. You have to look at the actual, um, you know, the debt that is being accumulated in the financial system, the leverage debt and liabilities. So I will entirely, I would say, I mean, this is quoting one of my gurus, uh, of the amount of, uh, you know, flawless he is. Uh, he used to say we used to have, we, we need to have more of Minsky and less of Robert Merton and all that contingent case <laughs> analysis, which is, of course, the linchpin of modern finance to understand what is happening, the crisis that is building up on balance sheets. So here is my, uh, 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 you know, I would say this is what we need to get back to, Granular data that needs to be collected by various uh, regulatory authorities, uh, as you know, in America and in the UK, uh, they are by law now required to collect whatever data they think is necessary to, uh, uh, you know, to see if there is a crisis, bro crisis brooming, uh, brewing. I mean, in the past they would say, well, we didn't have the data, and hence 
uh, we were unable to see uh, whether anything was kind of, you know, looming on the horizon. But now, actually, they are required by the uh, Financial Stability Act number three. Uh, they are actually, you can subpoena whatever data you would need if you think that is necessary to help you determine if there is a crisis. But the question is, what data would you go after? So this is actually my macro net. This is the, uh, the uh, Oli Castro and Rakan, Michelle uh, uh, Rakan's uh, macro net model. And uh, we are working to build such big net macro nets. What this is showing us in the internal area is the uh, banking systems, the banking systems that are exposed to various country um, sectors. So you, it's broken down, you know, each country uh, has its own sectors. So this would be the non-bank, this would be the household sector and so on. Uh, so you have the various sectors and they're interconnected via uh, various national, uh, national banking systems exposures uh, to these sectors. So, you know, so there's a national banking system, this is the American system, exposed to, let's say, via these cross-banking flows uh, within national banking systems, uh, they are exposed to the sectors of individual countries. So we need to build up, so you can see within the countries what this is, is a sectoral flow of fund map. So this is what I call an integrated system where you would uh, combine the macro sectors with the financial flows, but in a global setting. And I would say you would need this level of granularity and global reach in order to uh, sort of make out what the next crisis uh, has to bring and also because of the huge globalization of financial flows. Um, so here's what we have created. Uh, you can see, you would see that uh, these are the individual, this is France, the internal banking systems. But at the moment, the BIS data does not give us the national flow of funds. So you can see within country sectors are not interlinked. And that needs to, that is all the data gaps at the moment we need to fill up. Um, so what do we actually then learn from all of this? This again to wind back a bit. Um, here is the first uh, big uh, sort of granular map I did. This is for an IMF project on um, on the derivatives markets. What you have is five different markets. Um, we have here the CDS. Here we have the the thing that got us into trouble. It is the um, you know the uh, the the red one is the CDS. This is the interest rate swap uh, swaps and so on. And what you find is that the very internal uh, circle, what you have is the, the, the 16 broker dealers who are common to all markets. So what you can see is that a few entities are actually shouldering 97% um, of all of the liabilities in the derivatives markets. So there is, at the level of the system, uh, there is huge amount of concentration of risk. Now this is what is missed out when you look at the sort of micro level analysis. You would think derivatives are a good thing because they will permit you to remove uh, risk, credit risk in particular, using credit default swaps. But then if you don't follow how many people are actually giving you that sort of thing at the system level, if everybody is doing the same thing and it's transferred to the level of the system, if you do not see this properly, so I think this is one of the first maps where you see this, where at uh, the system level is a concentration of risk. Hence again, the macro, macro perspective is very important to understand systemic risk. Now here is a very granular map of the Indian financial system. Now for four years they've been digitally mapping. What you have at these various corners is the central part is the, uh, the banks, the circular bits uh, and the circles themselves. And what you have here is the insurance companies, the mutual funds, uh, the various uh, cooperative banks and so on. Now here what you have is you have a foreign bank. The foreign banks are the ones on the very periphery uh, with codes D. So th this is what I call a, a digital map. And at the, on a daily basis or on real time, uh, they, can <coughs> up, so they can call it up. This is just data visualization of all of the, uh, uh, the interconnections in terms of the bilateral linkages between banks and non-banks and bank between banks themselves. If you only study banks, you'd be led to thinking uh, that they are the liquidity suppliers. So the red, the, the blue uh, dots are the net liquidity suppliers and the red dots are the uh, net liquidity uh, demanders. So you can see that the liquidity suppliers in the entire macro economy of, the, of India is supplied by insurance companies and mutual funds. Now these are the sorts of things, if you miss these things, so if there's a crisis, here's a foreign bank borrowing from an Indian mutual fund. 
Now, that this is if it's visualized, visualized, you don't you immediately a query can go out. Uh, 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 this would immediately be spotted because this is what actually was happening right just before the uh, the crisis struck. And the Indian mutual funds, like the your, the U.S. ones and so on, they were teetering on the brink, but they because they they had huge like they had huge exposures to foreign banks in India. So here is an idea of what do I mean by granular models and how you visualize the data. Here is another issue about you cannot some you cannot sort of collapse all of these uh, networks because any entity is actually operating in multiple networks in markets that are, have topologies and network structures of their own. And then what you have is who's common to all of these. So I keep saying we really even have to go to what we call multi-layer multi frameworks. But we, are, we have absolutely not even gotten anywhere there. I'm jumping the gun and giving you uh, uh, the results right away. Because at the end of the day, all of these are pretty pictures. Unless you have pro appropriate systemic risk indices, ones that can give you robust some sort of early warning signals, so what we have here, we have mapped, though I'm a great champion of uh, Kastran and Rakan, their loss multiplier has exactly the same features as the sort of uh, market price based uh, systemic risk indices. In other words, they don't give any early warning signals. So in their paper, which is now out in the I think, Banking and Finance, in the Journal of Banking and Finance, uh, their loss multiplier, unfortunately, as you can see, gives no early warning signal. Uh, the blue line actually sort of jumps up only at in about 2007 and peaks here and you know uh, remains fairly sh showing that even the period after 2009 this is the best international banking system um, uh, the the systemic risk uh, involved there uh, so we see that both both our index which is the green one and theirs shows that even post 2009 there's a substantial amount of systemic risk so this is a point that uh, David's actually, you saw here, his stuff uh, you know, showed fairly subdued with systemic risk after 2009. But ours actually showed, at least in the global setting, that the crisis, the threat is still there. But in our case, you can see that since it's a liabilities based, uh, I'll go into the details, we give very <coughs> substantial uh, early warning. And uh, the, the, uh, the actual index here, we say that uh, we, we, we have a threshold, and I'll argue anything when you when uh, the, the threshold, the maximum eigenvalue, which is our, uh, our systemic risk uh, measure uh, based on a specially constructed uh, matrix, which I'll get to, uh, you will you, you have cause for concern when it exceeds 25%. Now, I'll argue why that is the case. So basically, what we're saying is that uh, it's all very well to sort of give network analysis and so on. But unless you have fairly robust uh, systemic risk indicators that can give you some sort of early warning, and here is the proof of the pudding. This is publicly available data, so we put ours through because you know the Indian data is confidential and so on. Uh, though we know that it gives us early warning, I can't actually reveal it to you. But in the BIS data, since all of this data that we use is publicly available, and we have a contrast with the Kastran and Rattan, we can actually see that uh, you know our method, which gives which is based on a fairly simple, uh, but of course requiring the bilateral data between various systems, uh, can give you some early warning signal. What, what kind of uh, error is in your measure? Uh, there is no error because we we take the data. We, it isn't. It, uh, there are no error bounds. It's an estimation. I imagine. It's not an estimation. It's just a numerical calculation, which I'll come to in a minute. Okay. Uh, right. So where do I get my systemic risk uh, measure? I, for that, I go, uh, go. I use a methodology first proposed by Robert May. I don't know whether you know who he is. He, uh, is, he he's a famous, um, you know, he was uh, the person of the Royal Society and so on. And he has uh, a famous paper called "Can Complex Large Complex Networks Be Stable?" It's a very interesting paper. It's not very long. Gives us a close form solution. First and foremost, he makes the case. And I make the case that at the end of the day, systemic, uh, you know, when you're, you're worried about stability and tipping points, in the end of the day, it's a study of a dynamical system. And the stability of a dynamical system has to be understood by spectral properties, in particular, maximum eigenvalue. So I'm saying I'm moving away from the sort of, uh, you know, risk neutral pricing models, and I'm saying systemic risk in terms of the network interconnected system 
should be understood as a stability problem of a dynamical system. This is what he also says. It is the property of an interconnected system in terms of its dynamics. And the only way you would understand whether or not it would have any sort of stability or whatever, he argues, you use the maximum eigenvalue. Now, it is about an eigenvalue, maximum eigenvalue of a random matrix with zero mean uh, 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 entries into the uh, matrix. And he gets a closed form solution for lambda max, which is very interesting. He says, the stability of the system, you know, so if lambda max is less than one, I will specialize this in terms of another threshold different to one in a minute. However, he says it's the square root of the number of nodes uh, and connectivity multiplied by sigma, and sigma is the standard deviation of, what he, of, of node strength. Node strength is none other than just the row subs. So what this is saying is that if the number of nodes of connectivity increases, if sigma is zero, close to zero, you have a homogeneous system. What that means is that everybody owes everybody else about the same, the same amount of money. There's no heterogeneity in, in the, either the degree distribution um, or any heterogeneity in the flows themselves. And the weighted uh, uh, nodes are also very homogeneous, so sigma will be close to zero. So if you have high connectivity, then you must have homogeneous networks, i.e. ones which are not uh, power law distributed or so on. I mean, derivatives and so on, what you find is they have huge heterogeneity. There is uh, certain nodes that are hugely connected compared to other nodes in the periphery which have hardly any connections. So sigma would be very high. If very, sigma is very high, then connectivity has to fall if the system has to remain stable. So this is, this is a complete eye opener. This is not how anybody thinks at the moment in terms of stability of systems. And as I told you, this has been put through its paces for four years in India and so on. So um, there is a trade-off which is not fully understood by um, uh, economists as yet, because as you know, the Allen and Gale paper says connect increasing connectivity is a good thing without qualifying anything about the structure of the homogeneity of the, uh, the node strength. So, um, so what do I mean? So this is actually the BIS uh, model in terms of backing flows. But before I go there, let me see. Let me, um, so, so, where, so, so basically, I'm now coming to the, the three questions if one really needs to understand uh, systemic risk. I'm saying, uh, first and foremost, we need to know from one network to the next, quarter by quarter, or whenever you are sampling these as snapshots, how would you know the system is more or less stable? You have to come up with a metric. Secondly, we need to, of course, know who's contributing to that, so who's systemically important. And the third thing is we really need to know how do you internalize the cost of being too interconnected, right? How do you stabilize the system? So we come up with solutions to each of these under this framework of the uh, may wigner condition. Um, so the, the problems here, as you know, is that you know, it was a revelation to me that real structures, topology matters. So here's a, con here's a simple, uh, indication of what I call a core periphery system. So in the matrix of interconnectedness, here you would have uh, you know, the core sec the sector where uh, you know, people in the core are highly connected here. And this is the core periphery, and the periphery of the core, and the periphery, periphery. Well, here nobody is connected. You know, this, this, is, this matrix will have all of these elements zero. So what would these pictures look like? Uh, so here we have a huge uh, core periphery structure you have a very highly interconnected core uh, here. So, um, you know, people who have high connections are connected associatively to the, the others who have high connections. Those in the periphery, as you can see, there are no connections between those on the periphery, hence that matrix notation. This is a random matrix, so there is no structure whatsoever. And uh, in a random matrix, you can see there is no way in which you can sort of segregate the network into an internal core and a periphery or anything like that. There is no tiering at all. Here, this is highly uh, tiered. Now, the way in which these systems would collapse is different. So this was the first thing we discovered uh, in our paper that's now published in Jibo and everything about the credit default swap markets. If you kill JP Morgan, you know, the, the highly, it's, a, it's a central core, it would kill uh, all of the, uh, the other big banks it's, it's connected to, and history, as we know, it would be over. Whereas it was, if it was an equivalent random graph, what would happen is there would be, because we wouldn't know uh, who would else would be killed uh, next, you know, the next, you know, in terms of uh, the connectivity, it would unravel like a sort of, um, in a random way. Now, the, the interesting thing about these two things is, 
Here, of course, it's very dangerous because a hub uh, being highly interconnected, uh, any big agent in it will kill other similarly connected agents. Whereas here, but this is easier to manage in terms of systemic risk because you strengthen that hub. You will identify the uh, highly interconnected agents and ask them to hold more buffers. That would be the answer. Whereas here, you would have to inoculate the entire population in a random graph. Uh, whereas here, you would uh, you would target and inoculate those with uh, we will argue high eigenvector centralities. So this is at the end of the day, this may be easier to manage. Uh, though this is highly unstable in a certain sort of way, right? Uh, so there's good news and bad news there. So here is, um, I'll skip this because we need to get to um, the actual maps. So which is the matrix that we're looking at? At the end of the day, I said Minsky influences us. So we have a so-called theta matrix. So what it is, is we are saying x i uh, j would be what i owes j minus what uh, J O S I, so it's a netted matrix, and what you have in the denominator is the capital. Because what we argue is that we would say that this whole system, you know, you can think of it as like a contagion uh, propagating system, as as you well know, like it's an epidemic model uh, that this is going to be embedded in. And uh, what we're saying is that uh, anybody, an agent which has a node which has more liabilities. Uh, than, uh, than uh, exposures, you know, so it is an out outflows and inflows, so it has no more outflows, more liabilities compared to uh, what other people are owing it, uh, divided by uh, its own capital. So uh, this is the exposure of two to the, uh, the one that's got net liabilities to two, and so on. So we're saying at the end of the day, uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, regulatory uh, uh, instrument that you have, you know, we, we have a short of instruments, the regulatory instrument that we have is just a capital threshold. So we're going to ma ma understand the maximum eigenvalue of this matrix re re relative to the regulatory threshold. What else would it be? Because the, the, the comparison at the end of the day has to be vis-a-vis -vis something that we are holding as being the regulatory requirement. So that is the threshold that is relevant to compare the maximum eigenvalue of the system. Um, so when we put this in into this um, uh, sort of equation, which is actually an epidemic uh, propagating uh, equation, what we have is one minus rho is the amount of buffers that we have. Uh, rho would be the threshold against which, which could be common if it's a regulatory threshold, against which uh, the, the, uh, the risks or the exposures that you face vis-a-vis -vis, uh, failed banks. So this is U I uh, U is the the indicator function on it says the banks that fail. So J are your counterparties. I is the bank. So how, depending on which of your counterparties fail, given that the counterparties uh, you're exposed to them relative to your capital, uh, you have this amount of buffers to protect yourself with. So this is the dynamical system. So if this is what you can protect yourself with, one minus rho would be the propensity to fail uh, based on your exposures and your own existing uh, remaining capital. So this is the system on which we would be working out the maximum eigenvalue. Setting it up in terms of matrix notation, you can, you can see this matrix Q uh, here is compo <coughs> composed of the interconnectedness exposures uh, divided by capital, so it's a normalization that's important. Uh, and therefore, this row is critical because we say if the maximum eigenvalue of this matrix uh, theta is greater than, so this would be the uh, actual result. You would say uh, if the lambda max of the theta prime matrix is less than rho, uh, then you have uh, the system could be stable. But you, of course, will concern when the uh, maximum eigenvalue of this matrix is greater than the regulatory threshold. That is when we have cause for concern. So if 6% is the risk-weighted assets, we, uh, we sort of reverted back to a absolute threshold constraint, and we'd say it's sort of 25% of capital in terms of absolute capital is the sort of threshold. So for an entire national banking system, you know, when we saw in that case of the uh, maximum eigenvalue here, when that sort of increased beyond here, you know, for instance, when it increases beyond 0.2 and so on, uh, 2.5 here, 
you have cause for concern that potentially the entire banking system stands to lose about 25% of its uh, capital. So that would be the threshold. That is when alarm bells should go off. And you can see it's pretty, it is fairly elevated even now. The crisis now uh, in, this, uh, in this view is not over yet by any long uh, stretch of the imagination. So, so this is where we differ from because it's critical to know when is it high, when is it low, you know, as you said. Without that, and what else would it be? So we use, this is all a lot of common sense. Firstly, we use the, what the one instrument uh, macro crew emphasizes. So what is important is, you know, in the, in the discussions about capital, what people don't understand is capital thresholds is only one side of the equation. The other side is how is the system stable vis-a-vis -vis that threshold? That, unless you find that other side of the equation, you don't have an answer. So you can do all the box ticking exercises, say, or all the banks are actually satisfying the, the capital requirements. But that's not the question. It's that the system as a whole, is it unstable vis-a-vis -vis that threshold? So this was a revelation to a lot of Indians, you know, when we discussed this, that it's all very well. You, I said, whatever you hold is your constraint, then check if your system is stable vis-a-vis -vis your capital threshold. That is the important thing because they keep said, telling me, oh, we have these exposure limits. I said, your exposure limits are not working they, because the system is still unstable and there were issues that they themselves um, uh, admitted. So here is our various calculations. I'll skip this. So um, now going back to the final leg of the whole thing, if this, if this is how the maximum eigenvalue is actually the upper bound of the maximum eigenvalue is an infinity norm of that matrix. It means none other than the maximum row sum. So maximum row sums have a very important role to play uh, in stability of systems. And of course, it's the standard deviation of that that comes up in that closed form solution. So uh, if you really need to stabilize the system, at the end of the day, what you need to do is somehow you have to, you know, you have to identify these row sums that are fairly, uh, you know, large, and then you want to some, sort of reduce that. So this is called the I algorithm to find out by how much various of the entities of the nodes uh, have to be taxed in order to reduce the maximum eigenvalue. And this is an algorithm we work out. Now the centrality, as you know, comes for free. In a maximum, you know, when you calculate maximum eigenvalue, uh, you associated with the maximum eigenvalue would be the, uh, the centrality vector. Uh, here is simply a maximum eigenvector centrality. Uh, unlike Bonacic and so on, it, it, it comes numerically ready to use, whereas a Bonacic centrality, as anybody knows, you have to use spatial econometrics to then work out the DK parameter, and we try to use it. Uh, it is damn tough to identify, it's full of, whereas this simply comes out of, if you manage to get a theta matrix, the capital is fu fully, fully available information. The interconnectedness has to be mandated, but once the data is in place, you just simply calculate this, as you can see, it is, uh, you know, yesterday, um, you know, David explained to us what this means. What this means is that you are actually linked to other people who are just as highly connected as you, uh, but it's, it's normalized by the maximum eigenvalue itself, one divided by uh, this uh, lambda. So, but there's a very interesting thing which we hadn't first uh, uh, understood. It depends whether you, you, have a, you have a right and the left eigenvector centralities. Uh, the right one in our opinion is the one, so I, I hope I have it now. Uh, the right one, for instance, is the one that would, so the V tilde is the left eigenvector centrality, and it tells you who is vulnerable, uh, most vulnerable in the system. And the right one tells you who is um, actually the CIFI, or the, who's causing the crisis, right, in terms of liabilities that they don't, that they default on. So the right and the left are very important. The directionality in all of these things is very important in the, Convey, in the conveying of uh, 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 contagion. So, um, and of course, we then need to say, it's all very well to list all of these things we have to do. Is there a correlation? In other words, ahead of time, uh, before you actually do the contagion analysis, which we do using a fur fine one, uh, the fur fine contagion analysis is a very simple one. It simply says in the network system, you, you, uh, you identify what they call trigger bands, kill one, one one at a time, and then find out total losses that are uh, rendered in the economy in terms of the capital losses. And then, of course, 
this is how uh, uh, Kastran and Rakan and Ramakant and all that work out systemic risk. They calculate the total systemic risk to the system in terms of the losses, of the loss multiplier. And I'm saying this is all, you know, you know why this would not give you early warning signal? Because the actual losses that materialize would peak after the crisis or just when the crisis is looming, it won't give you early warning. Because um, the, the losses comes after the balance sheets have been weakened. Whereas ours is liabilities based, which is growing before the crisis takes place. This is the difference. So this is all common sense. So you know, our, so we need to, of course, work out um, uh, whether or not the eigenvector centrality. That means I tell the people you don't have to use brute force and kill every bank at the time. You just check the centralities from one quarter to the next, and uh, they would change rank order, you know, as to who is central. And there's a very high correlation, as you can see, uh, between the rank order of the first five losses and the rank order that we give as a metric ahead of time. So um, so that is proof of the pudding, because unless it gives you, you know, rank orders that are similar, uh, you know, uh, what good is your methodology? So, um, oh, yeah, this, these are my crit. Now here is the final proof of pudding about uh, the uh, centrality of the banking systems in terms of uh, vulnerability and um, vulnerability and systemic risk. In other words, right and left centralities. This is the uh, right target vector centrality, and this is the left target vector centrality. Now, you know, last just a few months ago, this was done. This is the uh, the eurozone countries alone. You know, from the same risk data, and we saw that our method identifies by 2000 and uh, 13 quarter quarter four, our methodology identifies the problem in Portugal. Do you see this? Now IMF had given Portugal a clean, clean bill of health for its banking system, and our method shows that Portuguese banking system is the most vulnerable uh, amongst these, you know, the the periphery countries uh, in 2013. Now that was astounding because. IMF had just, you know, the Financial Times like, have a quotation. You know, they said that's it, the Portuguese banking, the, the, the uh, Santo Spirito collapsing and triggering a potential second order banking crisis was very much there. So why is it us? Why this is just the biz data and all the capital data from bank scope for each of these countries? So you see, what we're saying is that there is some means of actually you putting this to use. But Santo Spirito collapsed. The Portuguese banking system was vulnerable uh, like hell. Uh, and this, of course, is a Greek thing. The reason the Greek thing is lying on the floor is because we have to, it became negative. You see, you know, capital, capital uh, to negative equity, right? <laughs> so uh, hence these, uh, we, 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 we sort, of, uh, sort of took it out at that point. Uh, so, however, this is actually, uh, this was actually very interesting for me because I'm of the view if your methods actually don't deliver results and the sorts of things that uh, you want to be finding. Um, so, uh, the IMF, we were saying this uh, the other day, the Bank of England, the IMF, see, we have this problem. The IMF says, oh, you, you know, that's it. Uh, in uh, 2013, they said there was nothing wrong with the ba Portuguese banking system. But here we take the actual publicly available data and we come up, of course, that we have constructed a set of metrics, a systemic risk set of metrics, and we find that it comes up. So what we're saying is when this happens and you would delve deeper, you go and find out, you go into the banking system at that point and find out what the hell is happening. The point is we do need metrics that would give you right early warning signals. So I'll stop with that and um, <coughs> questions. Calculation. But why do we? So this is what we say. 
uh, you know, the Basel criteria, as you know, is uh, tier one capital minus loss given default divided by risk weighted assets should be less than 6%, okay. right? Now, what we want is we want an absolute criteria. So what does the threshold imply empirically in terms of to absolute capital threshold, right? So the 6% risk weighted threshold in a lot of jurisdictions translates to about 25% of, uh, okay. that's what it is. Okay. So uh, so we say that is the threshold to compare your maximum market value of that system in terms of stability. Because okay. if the maximum market value, that means the system potentially could lose, uh, you know, it, it, it has potential to lose about this much of capital in that system. So in an entire banking system, for a single bank, that could be the point at which you would be concerned about solvency, right? Sure. Um, so. So the starting point needs to come from the regulator setting some sort of... Absolutely, and when you set it, see, all along we've been wondering, you know, like you were checking if banks were meeting this, right, the threshold, whether they have that capital. But that is for a single bank. System stability is separate from that threshold. System stability is given by actual interconnected exposures and liabilities, right? That's what I'm saying, relative to the capital. So we want to check out whether the system stays stable vis-a-vis -vis what we consider to be the regulatory cash threshold. That exercise needs to be done. I keep saying every national banking system needs to check for this. Because it's no good saying, oh, our banks are holding the capital, but that's administratively set. It is not set vis-a-vis -vis the physical system that's actually out there, whose dynamics would determine whether or not there would be a, a instability. Uh, by the failure of a particular bank. You know, when it exceeds this threshold, what it means is potentially there is a bank or several banks that by their failure could result to the system losing a substantial amount of capital, uh, you know, in excess of this, what we hold as being regulatory requirements. Okay. So could you also compare systems where the threshold could be different? For example, the regulator hasn't made up Absolutely. You can pick your threshold and you can see whether or not your system is stable vis a vis that threshold. So there is an optimal threshold to begin with. There is no optimal threshold. Remember it's administratively set. Who picks out 6% risk weighted assets? Completely, uh, you know, it's completely cut out of thin air, right? But that is not the criteria. The criteria for stability is it's the stability of the system is a separate ex exercise to how you pick your capital requirement. But we haven't bothered to do that exercise which says, is our system stable vis-a-vis -vis an individual threshold of this kind, right? Then there are more interesting things to this. Now it's become popular in lots of, you know, like uh, Laurent Clerc, you know, he, he did this analysis on CDS. Now, the thing is, this is, a, this is the amount of capital that you can lose for the entire bank balance sheet, the entire capital requirement for an entire, back in all of its activities and all of its assets and markets, right? Is this threshold whatever it is, right? Now, uh, the question is, when you have a subset, when you're just modeling a subset like credit default swap <coughs> market, you have to be very careful. Do you do a pro rata of this capital requirements for that subset of the market? Because if you, don't, if you set the wrong threshold, there would be, you would, you would conclude there is no contagion. And I said, look, let me look at your threshold because we learned this the hard way. We learned that if, you're sub, if you are analyzing only a subset of the entire balance sheet of bank activity, then you have to do a pro rata on this threshold to see whether that system will end up losing what it is entitled to lose in that subset of uh, its capital requirements. Do, do you see that am making sense? Right, because otherwise you'd conclude, oh, CDS has no direct contagion. I, be, I said I back to Nifa. There are also other things that we realize about uh, how you report uh, various things, like uh, the, you know, I won't go into it, it was, it's to do with, um, you, know, in, uh, you know, whether it is the GAP method or whether it's the IFSRS, there are issues there. So how you uh, look at all of these things, you have to be very careful because uh, you can make wrong conclusions about whether or not contagion exists or not. So once you go down this route of mandating information, then th doesn't it matter what kind of seniority there is? Because the people you identify will have uh, exposures to the other banks, but some will have much more senior uh, sort of positions. Others will have losses coming first. And the people who are vulnerable will change as a result. 
So for example, Goldman Sachs isn't going to lose money because it's going to get its money first. So it may be on top you know, in terms of its exposure, but it's just going to get out. And the real guys who are going to get hit are someone else further down the periphery. And that will show like a, a different kind of waiting tier system here. Yeah, when we, when we managed all this data in the banks, non banks, uh, what they call funded and unfunded, which is, you know, derivatives markets, uh, what they call unfunded because it's a contingent claim. Money is not kept in advance. Just, we, you know, you have to take what, the, what that jurisdiction considers to be what I call contractual obligations. You notice something, I don't, I, I actually have against making, you know, you can do scenario analysis of all sorts of uh, uh, things that may happen in the future, such as fire sales and so on. But you cannot hold a, a, a bank liable for what might happen at a fire sales, right? You, can hold, you cannot hold a bank liable for what I call general macroeconomic conditions, like the Fed keeping the interest rates at 0%. You can hold a bank liable only for what they consider to be, they can, what is considered bilaterally as being the contractual obligations. You know, you have to play, play fair. So I've written a whole paper about that, you know, which is part of a talk I gave at the Bank of England. Because the current thing is, you know, they have all sorts of, Firstly, they haven't even identified a metric that works, right? Partly because, you know, this requires mandating of a special type of data, granularity of a very specific kind. Now, I was led to believe that this is the way to go down because I realized market price data. Way back in 2012, I realized it's not working. And then we had this uh, project at the Reserve Bank. We had to come up with a metric pretty quickly. And, uh, you know, so I said, look, look at the liabilities. I mean, this is what Minsky said. That is where the prices could be detected. Uh, you know, growing leverage and liabilities, and then, you know, ex if the exposed banks don't have sufficient capital, that is the beginning of the end. And so it is, it is very common sense, the film that says, you notice these matrix, uh, you don't have to, you know, it's just, it's a numerical calculation. Uh, once you mandate the data, uh, you know, we are ex we're expecting the banks to give us the correct picture of their, li their, ex you know, their contractual obligations um, across uh, various asset types and so on, right? It's a fairly complex, you saw when it's a bank-to-bank -bank and bank-to-non-bank, -bank, it's a fairly large uh, matrix. Uh, it, is, it is a totally non-symmetric matrix, unlike the correlation matrix, the directionality is very important and very precise. Correlation is not causation. It is, as you know, it is a symmetric matrix. If I, it's un undirected, whereas these are directed ma maps, right? Sorry. Uh, <coughs> if the index is in fact a threshold is 0.25, mm. uh, just say, how do you think that that system then can be unwound if we go through that threshold and you want to do something about it? You, it's dependent on this square root of NC signal. Uh, no, that, that, is, that is the closed form solution for a very uh, simple matrix. That's just giving you an intuition that the maximum eigenvalue or the stability of a network system has components to do with uh, the size of the network. You know, that topology matters. That I was really trying to convey that information. Uh, we, we are doing a fairly, uh, you know, in a, this, is a, uh, this is not a random network by any means. And there isn't a closed form solution, right? <laughs> However, uh, somebody called Sitabra Sina and so on, a kind of physicist in India, tipping points, he finds whether or not it's a random graph or a power law distribution network, he finds that uh, May Wigner condition is fairly robust. Uh, you know that the the elements that they pick out as number of nodes, connectivity, and heterogeneity are the key elements that would determine whether a system is stable or not. Right. right? But, but just from your own intuition of looking at the banks and the balance sheets, you know, if you get to this precarious position, is it? How, what, yes. What do you think that should? Yes. Yeah, so be so we we have we've invented a big tax. The 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 reason why this project still is running in India is because. You know, in, in this, it, just as we did for the, uh, you know, what do you call that, uh, the, this, we did the centralities, right? Uh, when, they, when we did the eigenvector centralities from quarter to quarter, uh, you know, you know, sometimes when you go into various projects and you put your head in the lion's cage, you say, God, give me a miracle, <laughs> right? You know, because this is a huge amount of data they're collecting and you always have scoffers wherever you go, right? And I, I'm, Okay, I've only given uh, myself and uh, Simone Gisante, who goes uh, about management school, uh, we work with the stability unit team there. And um, 
So I mean, quarter, if, so we had four quarters worth of data, and by quarter four, a bank which was not one of the usual suspects from centrality seven, I get back to centrality number seven, it jumped to number one, yeah. first to number two, and then to number one. And I said, there's your Northern Rock, there's Northern Rock <coughs> silence, because uh, they said we had uh, suspicions about this particular bank or reaching itself, and the, it was aggressive. Because in our network, in our network system, the only reason a bank would reach a very high centrality is because it's raw sum, i.e. its liabilities in that system is growing relative to the capital in that system, right? So I knew it was aggressively boring in the interbank market, and any person that is a bank that was winning Bank of the Year award. Because in, it is the individual rational thing for banks to increase market share. That's exactly what Northern Rock would do. But then it, it increases instability of the system as a whole, which is what we were able to show. And they said, oh, we had suspicions, but they didn't have any metric to show that this was happening. So, of course, now the question is, how do you penalize that bank? What, I mean, of course, they immediately do what they call moral suasion, in other words, a word in the year of the CEO, right? Which they did. Um, and secondly, but they wanted to know if they had to penalize that bank, what sort of, what sort of penalty? So the Pigou tax follows from, uh, you know, you, once you have the raw sums there, you would work out what you would have to tax it. You would tax according to eigenvector centrality. That would be the principal thing to do. Because eigenvector centrality is showing interconnectedness, centrality in terms of network interconnectedness. So this is a negative externality, and you tax them according to that. So there is, it is an equitable thing to do. So the more central you are, the more you need, providing, of course, the maximum eigenvalue exceeds the regulatory requirement. So you, you tax according to that. And we show that if you tax according to that, uh, and you bring down the maximum eigenvalue. Um, you know, so it's like road uh, congestion charging. I've designed some uh, externality uh, methods of how to charge for congestion. It is similar in that uh, respect. So you can put that money into an escrow fund if you want. So, but you know, we haven't got anywhere near there in terms of, in terms of macro prudential because really what we are struggling with is to come with an appropriate systemic risk measure. As we know, we've been struggling. And uh, um, you know this method is not entirely well known because the you know people from the Stern Business School are dominating the arguments at the moment. You know they have a lot of uh, airtime. You know uh, my my method is only being understood right now, right? Uh, I mean it's, it's developed with the two team of uh, two three people. Uh, so you know so it's just food for thought to think that stability is a property. Interconnected systems, you have to think of stability as being a property of dynamical systems, and it will be an like, spectral analysis. It wouldn't be anything else. That is my my firm uh, belief right now. Um, so, okay. Thank you.